Okay, two down. After you finish section three, you're more than halfway to Patty Open Water Diver and almost all the way to Patty Scuba Diver. During this section, we'll look at some things you'll need to know about the dive environment, plus go over some more detail about dive planning. We'll look at boat diving, one of the most fun ways to get out on the water. And you'll learn basic emergency handling in the problem management discussion. Then it's off to look at your next underwater adventure in the confined water dive preview for your third confined water dive. So let's go. You've probably noticed that the underwater world has variables that affect it. Temperature, visibility, bottom composition, aquatic life, and sunlight. You already know that you need to consider water temperature. How much insulation you need varies with how cold it is. But what's not so obvious is that temperature changes with depth, generally getting colder as you go deeper. Different temperatures tend to form distinct layers, so in calm water you drop abruptly from warmer into cooler water. This is called a thermocline, and the difference above and below it can be as much as 8 to 11 degrees Celsius, 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So for adequate protection, choose your exposure suit based on the temperature at your dive depth. Visibility affects the diving so much, it's often the first thing you want to know about the dive site. Lots of variables affect visibility. Water movement, weather, how easily you stir up the bottom, and so on. Limited vis makes it more difficult to keep track of your location and your buddy. You handle this by using your compass and other clues to navigate, and by staying closer to your buddy than you otherwise might. If it's real lousy, it may be better to pull the plug and do something else. Diving's supposed to be fun. Clear water can disorient you, too. The bottom might seem closer than it is, so check your computer or depth gauge frequently to avoid exceeding your planned depth. Earlier, you learned to dive relaxed and avoid overexertion. That's why you need to account for currents when you go diving. A current is water movement usually caused by the wind, heat, tides, or waves. Trying to swim against a current, even a mild one, can quickly tire and exhaust you. You suck up your air faster, too. You need to use the right techniques and avoid all but the mildest currents. When there's a mild current, you generally begin your dive swimming against the current. That way you don't have to fight it to get back to the boat or your exit point. If you accidentally end up down current from your exit, don't try to swim against it. Swim perpendicular to the current to reach the boat's trail line or to reach shore. Swimming against the current will quickly exhaust you. Try to avoid long swims against a current, especially on the surface. If you must swim against very light current a short distance, do it on the bottom if you can, where the current's usually much weaker. If you get caught in a current when boat diving and can't make the boat, don't fight it. Fill your BCD or drop your weights if necessary. Rest and relax. Stay calm, signal the boat, and wait for it to pick you up. Diving in strong currents requires special training and experience beyond what you'll have as a beginner. Most of the good stuff is on the bottom, so that's where you spend most of a dive. The bottom composition affects the techniques you use. Some bottoms, like silt, mud, and sand, stir up easily. You don't want to do that, so stay above the bottom and use care exiting and entering the water. Regardless of bottom type, stay neutrally buoyant and well above the bottom so you don't stir it up and so you don't harm any delicate underwater organisms. You'll learn to recognize unsensitive bottoms that you can settle on without significant risk to you or the environment, but it's best to avoid direct bottom contact as much as possible. Another fragile diving environment you may encounter underwater is a shipwreck or other submerged cultural site. 
Divers share a special privilege of having access to some of the world's underwater sites that may be part of our cultural heritage or maritime history. In order to preserve these sites for future generations, it's important to fine-tune your buoyancy and streamline your equipment to avoid disturbing or damaging the site during your dive. Resist the urge to remove articles from these sites and be certain to obey all local laws and regulations. And avoid tying to or anchoring on sites in a matter that may cause a disturbance or possible damage. Overall, respect our wrecks and the cultural heritage that lies beneath the surface of the water. As a diver, you'll interact actively or passively with the aquatic life. Active implies physical contact, which, more often than not, is associated with harming organisms, like bumping coral or hunting for fish. Passive interaction, on the other hand, involves leaving organisms relatively undisturbed, like taking pictures or just watching. As you might imagine, responsible divers engage primarily in passive interaction with aquatic life. The typical aquatic animal's response to an approaching diver is to flee. The vast majority are timid and harmless. If you spot a potentially aggressive animal, remain still and calm on the bottom. Watch it, but don't swim toward it because that could trigger defensive behavior. Chances are, it's just passing through. Enjoy the view because you don't get to see these creatures often. If it hangs around, calmly swim away along the bottom, keeping an eye on it, and exit the water. Nine simple precautions will help you avoid problems with aquatic animals. First, treat all of them with respect. Don't tease them or intentionally disturb them. Second, be especially careful where you put your hands and feet in murky water. Third, shiny jewelry can resemble bait fish or small prey, so it's best to dive without it. Fourth, if you spear fish, remove fish from the water immediately to avoid attracting predators. Fifth, wear gloves and exposure suits to avoid stings and cuts, but remember that some stingers and spines will go right through them, so stay cautious. Sixth, swim neutrally buoyant well above the bottom. Seventh, move slowly and carefully. And eighth, watch where you put your limbs. Finally, ninth, don't touch unfamiliar animals. If you don't know what it is, don't touch it. A good rule of thumb is that if it's very ugly, very pretty, or doesn't flee from you, don't touch it. The first thing you'll notice about aquatic plants is that they're easier to sneak up on than many aquatic animals. Aquatic plants range from giant kelp forests to grasses and algae in freshwater lakes and rivers. There's a small possibility of entanglement in some of these, but keep streamlined, watch where you go, and avoid dense growth areas, and this won't be much problem. If you do get snagged, it's usually no big deal. Stop and back up slightly. Don't turn around because it just wraps the vegetation around you. It's usually only a strand or two hanging you up, which you and your buddy can clear easily. If you're caught in more than a few strands, try breaking the strands by bending and snapping it. This is often more effective than trying to cut free with your knife. One thing about diving is that it gets you out in the sun a bunch. And that causes the most common diving injury, sunburn. It can really make you miserable, so be prudent. Wear sunscreen and protective clothing. Stay in the shade as much as possible, and don't forget your sunglasses. Freshwater sites include lakes, quarries, springs, and rivers. They're great for photography, exploration, and wreck diving. 
Freshwater diving considerations include currents, easily disturbed bottom composition, limited viz, cold water, and abrupt thermoclines in boat traffic, all of which are saltwater considerations too, of course. Freshwater diving can include diving at sites higher than 300 meters, 1,000 feet above sea level. This requires special training and techniques to account for the altitude. Fresh water doesn't make you as buoyant as salt water, so you don't need as much weight as when you wear the same gear and exposure suit in salt water. Most recreational diving takes place in temperate and tropical salt water. Salt water considerations include waves, surf, tides, current, coral, boats, deep water, marine life, and remote locations. Any place you go has unique aspects and considerations, so again, check out a local orientation to a new area. The ocean is a dynamic environment. It can be tranquil and calm, or angry and powerful. This directly influences diving, so your instructor will cover what you need to know for your open water dives. Be sure to get a local orientation whenever you are diving in new conditions. Dive planning avoids disappointments due to misunderstandings, forgotten gear, poor conditions and so on. It's really planning your fun. Think of it in four steps. Advanced planning, preparation, last minute preparation, and pre-dive planning. Advanced planning begins when you decide to go diving. At this stage, you generally call a buddy, decide on an objective, what you're going to do, pick a dive site, and decide on logistics, such as where and when to meet. Consult your logbook if you need to, and plan an alternate site in case you can't dive at your first choice. It's a good idea to prepare at least a day or two ahead of the dive and visit your local dive center or resort. Check the weather and dive report. Get your tank filled. And use a checklist as you go through your gear, inspecting everything. This gives you time to correct any problems you find. Just before you leave, check the weather and let someone know where you're going, when to expect you back, and what to do if you're not. Grab last-minute stuff like your jacket, sunglasses, ice chest, and so on. Pack your dive bag, if you haven't already, with what you need first in last if you're boat diving. Finally, do an idiot check so you don't accidentally forget something. Right before the dive, plan the details. Check the conditions and decide whether to dive or head to your alternate site. Agree on where you'll enter, exit, and the course you'll follow. Review hand signals and communications. Decide what to do if you become separated, what your air, depth, and time limits will be, and what to do in an emergency. If you're a paddy scuba diver, you'll make the pre-dive plan with a paddy instructor, assistant instructor, or dive master who's leading your dive. Now do it. You have fewer problems and more fun when you plan your dive and use the plan. Plans don't have to be complicated, nor take a lot of work. They can be simple, take only a couple of minutes to discuss, and offer flexibility, but you should follow them. No one can plan a dive and follow that plan for you. You and your buddy have to do it. Although there's a lot of good diving from shore, if you're a diver, you're going to spend time on boats. They take you to sites you can't reach from shore. They eliminate long surface swims, and best of all, boating is fun. If you'll be boat diving in this course, your instructor will cover what you need to know for your open water dives. And as mentioned earlier, be sure to get a local orientation whenever you are boat diving in new conditions. Diving has an impressive safety record that's better than many other sports and adventure activities. 
But common sense tells you that going in water and under it presents risks and hazards. The Paddy Open Water Diver and Scuba Diver courses teach you to minimize these. But if a problem does arise, you'll want to be able to care for yourself or another diver. We'll look at recognizing when a diver needs assistance, how to provide aid at the surface, and handling underwater problems. But if you'll be diving where you don't have secondary assistance, a dive master, instructor, lifeguard, or paramedic immediately available, you should have additional training in first aid, CPR, and diver rescue. The PADI Medic First Aid course and the PADI Rescue Diver courses provide these, expanding and refining your problem prevention and management skills. You'll probably find these among the most challenging and rewarding courses you complete as a diver. For now, focus on problem prevention and be prepared with emergency contact information such as local paramedics and police, radio frequencies for the Coast Guard, and contact information for the local diving emergency service, such as the Divers Alert Network. If there's no service where you're diving, then have contact information for the nearest recompression chamber. In any case, carry a mobile telephone, radio, change for a payphone, or some other way to contact help. Your instructor will provide information for your area. Although you scuba dive underwater, most problems occur at the surface. You prevent and control most problems simply by staying within your limitations, by relaxing, and by establishing and maintaining ample buoyancy at the surface. The first thing to do if you have a problem at the surface is to get buoyant if you're not already. Let your equipment work for you. Don't waste energy and exhaust yourself trying to stay up. Drop your weights. That's why they have a quick release. You can usually recover them later, and if not, they're easy to replace. If you need help, do the smart thing and ask. Whistle, wave, or yell, and get aid before a small problem becomes big. Just it makes relax. things we'll easier on you here. and other Check divers. Okay, grab onto that and I'm coming it's out. often obvious when a diver has a problem, but often not. And you need to know the difference between a diver with a problem in control and one out of control, so you respond appropriately. Divers with a problem and in control normally appear relaxed. They generally signal for help if needed, keep their equipment on, move deliberately, and respond to instructions. Divers who panic have lost self-control and succumb to sudden, unreasoned fear. Instinctive, inappropriate behavior replaces trained, reasoned behavior. They typically fail to inflate their BCDs or drop their weights. They spit out their regulators and push their masks up or off. Fearing drowning, they expend tremendous energy keeping their head out of the water. Their eyes are wide and unseeing, and they don't usually respond to directions. Panic divers need immediate help because they will struggle until exhausted and unable to stay up. Assisting another diver has four steps. First, establish buoyancy for yourself and the diver. Second, calm the diver. Third, help the diver re-establish breathing control. And fourth, assist the diver out of the water. You reduce risk by assuring you won't sink. If you're in the water with the diver, inflate your BCD and ideally extend something that floats to the diver. If you're out of the water, stay there. Extend or throw flotation to the diver. If you don't have anything to give the diver, inflate his BCD or drop his weights, or both. Once buoyant, the diver will probably relax a bit. Talk to him and encourage him to breathe slowly and deeply. Then, if necessary, assist him out of the water. You'll practice towing another diver in your third confined water dive. You prevent most underwater problems by relaxing while you dive, keeping a close eye on your SPG and staying within your limits. 
The most likely underwater problems are overexertion, running low on or out of air, a free-flowing regulator, and entanglement. In section two, you learned how to prevent and handle overexertion. Overexertion makes you feel air-starved. As you learned, keep a slow, relaxed pace. If you or your buddy start to get out of breath, stop, rest, and catch your breath before moving on at a slower pace. You easily prevent running low on or out of air by watching your SPG. Sudden air loss due to a malfunction is almost unheard of, but suppose it happens. It's not a serious situation if you consider your options and take action. If you start up when your regulator begins breathing hard, you may be able to ascend normally, breathing lightly but continuously, because as water pressure decreases, you can use more of your tank air. Ascending with an alternate air source, like you've practiced, is your best all-round option. But you have to know where to find and how to use your body's alternate, so be sure to review that during the pre-dive safety check. Even if you're not as close to your buddy as you should be, you can still reach the surface safely using a controlled emergency swimming ascent if you're no deeper than, say, 10 to 12 meters, 30 to 40 feet. Simply look up, reach up, and swim up, keeping all your gear in place and making an ah sound so you exhale all the way to the surface to prevent lung overexpansion injury. If you're too deep for a controlled emergency ascent and too far from your buddy to use his alternate, make a buoyant emergency ascent. Drop your weights, then ascend looking and reaching up while making an ah sound all the way to the surface. You'll exceed a safe ascent rate, so use this as a last resort if it's the only way to reach the surface. When you reach the surface following a low air or out of air emergency, you'll need to inflate your BCD orally or drop your weights to establish buoyancy. Today's regulators are very reliable and designed for fail-safe malfunctions that usually provide continuous air, free flow, rather than cut off your air. You can breathe from a free-flowing regulator and you'll learn how in your next confined water dive. Entanglement is rare, but possible in aquatic plants, fishing line, tree branches and the like. Avoid it by watching where you go, moving slowly, and keeping your equipment secured. But if you get hung up on something, stop, think, and then free yourself calmly. Get your buddy to help. If you're low on air or severely entangled, you may need to cut yourself free. If so, be careful about what you cut. Don't complicate the situation by cutting your gear, yourself, or the wrong thing. With tough rope or cable, cutting may be slower than disentangling. Do what's fastest. Swallowing water, extreme fatigue, entanglement, lung overexpansion, and other incidents can cause near drowning, becoming unresponsive and stopping breathing underwater. Near drowning requires an immediate response. The primary concern is to check for breathing and begin rescue breaths if the diver isn't breathing. If the diver has no pulse, you need to get the diver out of the water to perform CPR. Here are four general procedures if a diver appears to lose consciousness and become unresponsive underwater. First, bring the diver to the surface and check for breathing. Second, establish ample buoyancy for you and the victim. In some situations, you might do this and then check for breathing. Third, call for assistance as needed and available. Finally, help get the diver out of the water. Follow these procedures once you get the diver out of the water. They also apply to a diver who becomes unresponsive or experiences lung overexpansion injury symptoms after a dive such as difficulty breathing, confusion, lowered alertness, unclear thinking, paralysis, 
visual problems, or chest pain. Keep the diver's airway open and check for breathing and pulse continuously. Provide rescue breathing and CPR as needed. If the diver has a pulse and is breathing, keep him lying on his left side in the recovery position if doing so doesn't interfere with any aid you're providing. If the diver's responsive, lying supine is fine. Administer emergency oxygen and keep the diver still. Maintain normal body temperature by protecting her from heat or cold as necessary. Get emergency medical assistance. And if someone cannot go with the diver to medical treatment, write down as much background information as possible and send it with the diver. Time to dive again. Let's look at the fun you'll have in Confined Water Dive 3. By now you're aware that you use neutral buoyancy to dive relaxed, maneuver easily, ascend under control, and so on. During this dive, you'll practice the fin pivot, which develops your ability to fine-tune your buoyancy. And you'll do this by inflating your BCD orally, as well as with your low-pressure inflator. You might do this after disconnecting a leaking inflator. Take a breath, switch to the BCD hose, and blow about two-thirds of your breath into it. Save enough to clear the regulator, and remember, blow bubbles when the regulator's out of your mouth. You might need to do this a few times. To fin pivot, lie face down, breathing slowly and deeply. Add air in short bursts to your BCD, or one breath at a time if you're inflating orally. Then inhale to see if you rise off the bottom. Gradually add air until you pivot up when you inhale and down when you exhale. This means you're neutrally buoyant. Some divers need to pivot on their knees or other body point, which is okay, but fin tips are best. By the way, if you're using a dry suit, your instructor will have you adjust it, not your BCD, to set your buoyancy. Once you're neutral, you'll notice your buoyancy changes with depth changes because the air in your BCD or dry suit expands or compresses. To maintain neutral buoyancy, add air as you go deeper and release air as you ascend. During your open water dives, to prevent an uncontrolled ascent, you release air from your BCD frequently as you go up. After you're neutral, your instructor will let you practice swimming around, adjusting your buoyancy. Pretend you're swimming over sensitive reef and try to keep from touching the bottom. This gets you ready for diving on a real reef. A cramp is a painful, involuntary muscle contraction. This can happen due to dehydration, cold, restricted circulation, wrong fin size, and working a muscle beyond its fitness level. It hurts, but it's easy to handle. Stop and rest the cramped muscle, gently stretching and massaging it. You can stretch out a leg cramp by pulling your fin tip, or by having your buddy brace your foot to push against. After relieving it, rest a few moments before resuming at a reduced pace. Sometimes a buddy's too tired or has severe cramps and can't swim effectively. Help out by getting both of you positively buoyant, then using the tired diver push, sometimes called the modified tired swimmer carry, which is simply a way to give the diver a push. Or you can assist by pulling with the tank valve toe. You'll practice both. You already know how to use an alternate air source and what it feels like to run out of air. Now you'll put these together. Your instructor will turn off your air just like before. When you feel it's hard to breathe, signal and secure your buddy's alternate. Your instructor will have you swim with your buddy using the alternate for at least a minute. When you switch back to your regulator, check your SPG to be sure your air's back on.
Remember that a regulator malfunction is most likely to make it free flow. Now you'll practice breathing from a free-flowing regulator. You'll hold the purge button in to simulate the malfunction. Hold the mouthpiece near your mouth, but do not insert it fully. Let the excess escape while you sip the air you need. The flow may jostle and flood your mask a bit, but no worries. After you're done, which will be at least 30 seconds, check your SPG. You may be astonished just how much air you burn that quick. Recall that one option in a low or out of air emergency as deep as about 10 to 12 meters, 30 to 40 feet, is a controlled emergency swimming ascent. You'll practice this during this confined water dive, but since you won't be as deep as that, you'll practice horizontally. In open water, you'd reach up and look up, so for horizontal practice, you'll look and reach ahead. Then keeping all your gear in place, you swim while exhaling continuously with an ah sound, so you don't hold your breath and risk lung overexpansion injury. For horizontal practice, you'll swim about 9 meters 30 feet. After you get it down horizontally, your instructor may have you practice diagonally from the deeper to shallower water. And you'll find that when you do this for real during your open water dives, it's easier than going horizontally. Time to get into the real cool stuff your open water dives. The first thing you do at a dive site is check out the conditions. Your instructor will show you how to account for weather, water temperature, bottom composition, waves, local area hazards, and so on. You'll also plan your entries and exits. Decide whether you can make the dive safely. This is your responsibility. If not, check your alternate site. You dive for adventure, fun, and a challenge not to face unreasonable risk. Poor timing and sequence when you kit up can get you tired and overheated, like if you get in your exposure suit too soon or gear up way ahead of your buddy. Gear up at about the same pace as your buddy so you're ready to hit the water together. First, assemble your scuba unit and prep anything else that you can, like defogging your mask, before putting on a heavy exposure suit. Then put on your exposure suit and weights. When you're ready for your scuba unit, have your buddy help if necessary. Next, put on any wrist mount gauges, then go through the pre-dive safety check. Finally, don your mask, snorkel and gloves. Put your fins on just before entering the water if you're boat diving, or in waist-deep water when you're shore diving. Suiting up takes some forethought at first, but it becomes second nature after a couple of dives. The best technique for getting in the water depends on where you're diving. If you're not sure the best entry for where you are, get an orientation so you can enter and exit safely. For shore diving, the general recommendations are to begin with all your gear on, except perhaps your fins. Depending on the environment, you may put them on first, or put them on in water waist to chest deep. As a general rule, use your regulator until you're floating in deeper water, so if you stumble, you can breathe even with your face under. In deeper water, fill your BCD and switch to snorkel to save air. If you're walking with fins on, walk backward or sideways and shuffle your feet. This helps avoid holes and obstructions and scares off animals that could sting if you step on them. As soon as the water is deep enough, swim out on the surface. Swimming's usually easier than wading. Surf entries and exits require special training, but it's possible you'll enter and exit through mild surf during your open water dives. Your instructor will cover surf entries and exits specific to your dive site. 
You'll find open water surface swimming a bit different from your confined water dives because you'll cover longer distances and may have currents and waves. Fill your BCD no more than about halfway to minimize drag and pace yourself. Surface swimming's more tiring than underwater swimming. Use your snorkel and breathe cautiously so you don't choke on waves splashing into it. Remember to keep your feet underwater and you might prefer swimming on your back. Check your location, direction and buddy frequently. There are a few differences between open water descents and the ones you've practiced in confined water. But one is you're going down farther. If you're weighted properly, emptying your BCD and exhaling should start you down. Remember to equalize early, often, and without forcefulness before you feel discomfort. Keep your head above your feet so you stay oriented. Your descent rate speeds up as water pressure compresses your exposure suit. So put air in your BCD as you go to reach the bottom neutrally buoyant. You may use a line for the first couple of dives. If it's an anchor line, avoid getting jerked up and down by letting your arm swing up and down with the line as the boat rises and falls on the waves. Ready? You're ready to hit confined water dive three and you'll be in open water real soon.